but we are getting ready to get into the word of God today, which I'm also excited about. We are doing the fourth and the final installment of our blessed or blocked series, our series on generosity. God has really been speaking to us in this series, and today we are going to finish it up. And I'm just going to read one verse of scripture for you. It's actually a very familiar passage. And even though it's just one verse, I'm just going to ask if you could stand with me. Uh, that's just what we do here at Link Church. It's just something that we do to respect the word of God. But this is a familiar passage of scripture. And it's coming from John chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want to talk to you this morning from the topic, I am an answer. Let's quickly pray. God, I thank you today for your goodness and for your love. Thank you for your mercy. I'm grateful, God, because I know that you are getting ready to continue having your way in this place. So we just pray that your word would go forth and, and do what you have accomplished for it to do. We thank you, God, that this word is going to fall on good ground. And that after we leave here, God, we will be able to say that it was good for us to have been here. Thank you, God, for all that you've done in Jesus' name amen you can take your seats so you know if I had to pose a question to you I would ask you what is love really because a lot of people relegate love to an emotion to a feeling to how you view a person or how you view a thing but I'm one of those people that agrees with the school of thought uh, that love is a verb that love uh, is an action that it's not necessarily all about what you say but you show me that you love me or don't love me by what you do and so for for example, there are people who say that they love coffee, but I know that you don't because of the amount of cream that you put in your cup. There's some people that I'm like, if you like milk, just say that. If you like cream that has flavor of coffee, just say it. If you like tea, just say that. Because there's some people that put so much cream and sugar in their coffee that I'm wondering, why not just have sugar milk with your breakfast? I don't drink my coffee black, but I, I don't just put in half of a can of creamer in it either. So you say you love coffee, but your actions determine that was a lie. Right? There are some people who say that they love food. They say that they're foodie, but then they're also vegan. You don't love food if you're a vegan. Nothing against vegans. There may be somebody sitting in here today that's like, I had soy turkey and it was good. Good for you. But you don't love food. You love grass and trees and herbs. You love the garden. You're going back to Eden. I get it. Just say that, though. Because what you love is determined by how you behave. And I think that if anybody had a deep love that we can't even wrap our heads around, it would be Jesus. Now, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say that he liked the world. Because like is, is okay, but it went deeper than that. It didn't say, for God so loved Jews. Because if he only loved Jews, those of us sitting in here today would be in trouble. He didn't say, for God so loved Gentiles. Because then Jews would have been in trouble. He didn't say, uh, for God so loved the wealthy. Because then the poor would be in trouble. He didn't say, for God so loved the healthy. Because then the sick would continue to be in despair. He didn't say, for God so loved the blacks. Because then everybody else would be uh, having something to worry about. He didn't say, for God so loved the Latinos. Because uh, then the rest of us uh, would be having something to worry about. But the Bible says, for God so loved... And I stop right where it says so loved because I think that Jesus wanted us to understand that his love for the world was immeasurable. His love for the world was intense. Uh, you know the song that says that God's love, it's, it's overwhelming, it's reckless, it's never ending. It's the only type of love that chases after somebody that doesn't want to be chased. Well, unless you watch Lifetime movies, they also chase people that don't want to be chased. 
But Jesus' love is the only love that chases people that don't want to be chased. He's the only love that gets dirty even though he's clean. He's willing to get down uh, and pick up somebody who's dirty even when they're filthy. His love is the only love that comes without condition. His love is the only love that doesn't have an ulterior motive. He loves you because he's good, not because you're good. He loves you because he's kind, not because you're kind. He loves you because he's perfect, not because you're perfect. The love of God is unfathomable. It's something that no matter which language you use, whether you use English or Spanish, Hebrew or Japanese, you cannot describe the love of God. You also can't contain the love of God. It's a concept that goes beyond our finite minds because the love of God is infinite. He so loved the world unconditionally unfathomably intensely and passionately for God so loved the world he so loved the world and you're probably like first of all this is not Easter so why are we on John 3 16 it's not good Friday because I'm going somewhere with this one verse for God so loved the world now if you stop there that's also something to say but that's incredible because you think about the world and you're like oh well the world is you know made up of all of the continents and the oceans all of the mountains and all of the rivers and all of the trees and all of all the plants and the birds and the fish but there is something sinister also about the world because ever since man took a fall, the world has not been such a good place. The world is a place that can be dark and it can be ugly. The world is a place that can be evil because you've got uh, drug dealers in the world. You've got pedophiles in the world. You've got uh, those who uh, participate in human trafficking in the world. You've got witches and you've got warlocks in the world. You've got soothsayers in the world. You've got those who declare that there is no God. You've got atheists in the world. You've got those who who lift up their shrines and their temples to false gods and believe in false religions in the world. You've got those who are unrepentant in the world. You've got people who rebel in the world. You've got murderers in the world. You've got gossipers in the world. You've got people who sow discord in the world. You've got unforgiveness and bitterness in the world. There's anger and there's hatred in the world. The world is a deplorable place. You've got people who just are vile in the world you've got satan in the world he's the prince of the power of the air and so how could god love a place that's filled with evil how could he love a place that's got witchcraft how could he love a place that's got murderers and liars and pedophiles and drug dealers how could he love a place that's got addicts of all kinds how could he love a place filled with people who don't love him back how could he love a place that is so uh incomprehensibly uh evil and dark sometimes and yet God says but I love it the thing about God's love as it relates to the world is that God was not insecure about what or who he loved because his Bible, his scriptures say, for God so loved the world. He is making a definitive statement. He's letting us know that this is not a maybe. This is not a sometimes. This is not when y'all act right. This is I so love the world. And you wonder, but how could he love such a thing that's filthy or dirty? God loves the very thing that is unlovable. He accepts the very thing that should be rejected. And that's what makes God so amazing is that he loves the very thing that people don't understand. And he's secure in his love for it. But many of us get tripped up because God has called us to love someone or something that isn't glamorous many of us are insecure about what we love we love the thing that people say that 
You shouldn't love that. And here's what I mean. Some people have been called uh, to rescue those who have found themselves in human trafficking situations. And some people would say, turn a blind eye to that. Don't get involved. The people involved in that are dark. You don't want to get caught up. You don't want to be out here uh, being distracted. You don't want to be out here in danger. And so you're insecure because on one hand, you hear God telling you that that's the population that you're called to. But you're insecure because it is a population that is uh, ugly. It is a population that's not popular. It's a population that's not glamorous. Some of you have have been called to patients who are dealing with HIV and AIDS, but you don't want to say that I so love people with that disease because it is a disease that is still taboo. No one wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to walk around it. Nobody wants to touch it. Some of you are insecure about what you love because you're called to children in foster care and people around you are saying, don't you have enough children of your own? Don't you know already that if you take in any of these kids, they're going to be a problem. They're going to be a headache. They're going to be an issue. And so you now try to hide because you're insecure about what God gave you a love for. You can't definitively stand up and say to somebody, for I so love children in foster care, for I so love patients with HIV and AIDS, for I so love people in human trafficking because it's not glamorous. It's more glamorous to say, well, I'm called to consult with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. That would be more glamorous. I, I remember watching a movie, and in the movie, Chris Tucker is part of the LAPD, and he says his mom is so embarrassed by him being a part of the LAPD, she tells people he's a drug dealer. Because he's like, my own mama is ashamed of me. She tells everybody I'm a drug dealer. Because that, that's better than being LAPD, apparently. And so we do things based on the reaction we're going to get from other people. I, I'll love what, what's popular. I'll love what's trending. I'll, I'll love what people say I should love. People told me I should have been a psychiatrist because they said, well, you have an interest in people that are uh, e e having emotional and mental challenges. And then they said, but you should be a psychiatrist so you can prescribe medicine and make more money. But I said, but I never wanted to push medicine on people. I wanted to restore them uh, in another way. Now, I'm not saying you cannot take uh, a medicine. What I'm saying is that wasn't what I loved. You want to know what's not glamorous? Some of you are called to be intercessors. And I can tell you from personal experience, it's not glamorous. Because being an intercessor is more than just praying for yourself and being done for the day. When you're an intercessor, you see things you don't want to see. When you're an intercessor, you feel things you don't want to feel. When you're an intercessor, somebody can tell you that they're having a great day and you can see right through it. You may not tell them that you know that they're not doing well. They can tell you, PJ, I'm doing great. And the Spirit of God says they're actually completely the opposite. Now, I don't always speak on it if he doesn't tell me to. But then what happens is I go home and I got to carry not only what I'm working with or dealing with, but now I got to carry the person who says they're great, but they're not great, says they're fine but they're struggling says that they're joyful but they're depressed I can feel it but then there's a part of me that also loves prayer even though it may not be glamorous I so love prayer that I won't let a day go by without it I so love prayer that I read books about it I so love prayer that I remember one time a couple years ago, this is a true story. I, I got up, uh, my husband and I were finishing a show, and so I got up and I was getting ready to go into my closet, and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm getting ready to go pray. He was like, you got one more time to pray today. Now, now you know maybe you're going overboard if your spouse has to be like, you got one, you got one more time to go into that closet. But it becomes, a, it becomes a habit. It becomes a lifestyle. It becomes something that you love. And yet sometimes we're insecure about what God has given us to love. But here's what I will tell you. If you truly love something, you cannot get away from it. You can't stay away from it because it pulls you. It's 
giving you this uh, unction and this urge. You gravitate towards it. No matter how ugly and dark the world got by the time God came in the flesh, he was gravitating towards it. He knew that there was something that he needed to do. He couldn't get away from it. Even though we've disappointed him and even though we've made him upset and even though we've done things that he would rather us not do, he so loved us and there's something about loving something that if you love something you will give yourself to it you cannot say you love God and you keep giving him a no you will give yourself to him if you love him you cannot say that you love to do certain things and you won't give yourself to it you can't say you love books but you never read you can't say that you love music and you never rehearse you can't say that you love communicating the word of God and you never study. You can't say that you love saving money and you're always spending it. You can't say you love to cook and you're always in the drive through Whatever you love, you will give yourself to that thing. Because there is something like a magnetic force that pulls you towards who you are and what God has called you to love and that thing. And so then the Bible goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave. That's proof that you have to give if you love. Because generosity is rooted in radical love. He gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. Now, here's the thing about God. Even God had a moment where he said, I just don't know if I can give myself to this thing. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Because when some of us look into a cup, our cup just has water, sweet tea, coffee, hot tea. But in God's cup, uh, there was every sin under the sun. Things I wouldn't even say or think of. Things that we don't even want to mention. That's what he saw in his cup. When he looked in his cup, he didn't just see the sins of the 12 disciples that had been walking with him. He didn't just see the sins of those that were currently alive in that time period period he saw the sins of those that would be born five years later ten years later 1,500 years later 3,330 years later all of that sin was wrapped up in that cup he looked down and he saw dirt and he saw filth he saw pain and he saw agony he saw destruction and he saw people that would not repent he saw all sorts of ugliness and madness he saw insanity and he saw anxiety and he saw depression he saw low self esteem he saw everything imaginable and said if it's possible I don't even want to do this thing but nevertheless not my will but yours be done because I love the world too much uh, to turn my back on it uh, I love the world too much uh, to give up uh, do you know there's a scene in the passion of the Christ where Satan is talking to Jesus and even Satan says why are you doing this why leave them alone they're not worth it yeah. and if you know the movie verbatim you're like that's not how Satan said it well I'm paraphrasing Y'all know, know what I mean. But can you imagine how realistic that would have been for Satan to want to get in Jesus' head and say, they're, they're not worth it. They're not worth Don't die, die for them. Some of you have such unique callings on your life and people have told you, don't fool with them. Don't fool with that. Don't get involved in that area. Don't get involved in that arena. Don't do that thing. But now there's something that's pulling you. Because you so love that thing that there is this force. There is a, a, a force that pulls.
hold uh, Jesus to the cross. It was like when you have a paper clip and you hover it over a magnet, the two have no choice but to meet. And Jesus was like that paper clip and the cross was like that magnet. And there's something that causes the two of them that have to meet and it's God's love. It's his radical love that causes him to be radically generous because he's like, I have to give my life to that thing. And do you know why God decided to give his life to that thing, to the cross, to us? Is because he looked in heaven and he looked in earth to see, is there any other sacrifice that could be made? Is there any other person that could do this for him? Up until this point, they would, uh, they would use an animal sacrifice. Uh, but God started realizing that as time goes on, this animal sacrifice is not sufficient. Uh, I love the world too much to see them struggling in their sin. I love them too much to see them struggling, trying to find a sacrifice without blemish. I'm hurting seeing them uh, struggling every Passover, trying to get it right. And since there's nobody else, uh, I'm just going to have to be the final Passover lamb. I love them so much that I'm going to give them everything that I've got. And some of you are struggling because you are called and you are anointed. And God has told you what you should be doing. But you're looking for somebody else to get the job done. You're looking in heaven and you're looking in earth. And you're saying, God, somebody else could do the work at church. Somebody else can take on the project at work. Somebody else can deal with the AIDS victims. Somebody else can preach. Somebody else can teach. Somebody else can sing. But God says, and hey, you are the one that I have called. It's you that can get the job done. Like Jesus, you're looking for somebody else. But there was a point where Jesus said, wait a minute, I'm the one for the job. See, the enemy has made you think that, well, we have enough singers. You don't have to sing. We have enough preachers. You don't need to accept the call to preach. We have enough musicians. You don't need to play. We've got, and listen, the enemy has told you we've got enough of everything that you currently possess. I don't care if it's administration. I don't care if it's parking lot. I don't care if it's uh, being an entrepreneur. I don't care if it's finding a cure for a disease. The enemy has told somebody in here and deceived you into thinking that they got it covered. God says it's not covered because you're not on your post. And your generosity has to be fueled by your radical love. You've got to love the thing that I've called you to so much that you will give yourself for it. You know why I get up here each time that I have to and I preach? Because I know there's other female preachers out there. But I also know that my name is PJ and I bring a certain flavor that other people don't bring. Doesn't mean they're not good. Doesn't mean they're not anointed. There's a lot of female preachers that I actually admire and I can learn from. But we're different. We're not the same. We're not wired the same. We don't have the the same experiences we don't have the same personality they may not have as many jokes as me and so somebody's got to get up and get the job done God is saying to you that I need you to be generous enough to give us what you have even if you think it's insignificant even if you think it's already covered because as long as you're not generous with what you have in life and in the kingdom of God, there is a post that is not covered. There is a group of people who are suffering because of our lack of generosity. Without Jesus going to the cross, I am a mess. I can't talk about anybody else, but I can tell you without Jesus, I'm a mess. Without Jesus, I'm not delivered from depression and anxiety. Without Jesus, I'm definitely going to hell because there's no way for me to be saved. Without Jesus, I lose my mind based on some of the things that I've experienced. 
But because he was generous enough to say, you know what? Uh, there's going to be some people in Jen's life that are going to do some nice things for her. They're going to say some nice things to her. But can't nobody deliver her like I can. Can't nobody save her like I can. Can't nobody pull her up out of that depression and anxiety like I can. So I've got to be generous and get the job done. Somebody is waiting on you to be radically loving and radically generous. Because without you, they die. Without you, they're in despair. Without you, they keep getting trapped. Without you, they die from their disease. Without you, they don't know the word of God. Without you, they don't know how to start a business. Without you, they don't know how to keep their marriage. Without you, they don't know how to raise their kids. I don't know what you've been called to, but I know that so long as you are lacking in generosity, then there are people who are suffering and they will die. Not because there's nobody else in the world that is a business coach or a life coach or a parenting coach, but there's nobody who can touch the people that you are called to and so I love the end of the verse of John three sixteen that says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life you know why I like the end of that verse because it shows us that radical generosity solves a problem Everybody sitting in here today has been called to solve a problem. Sometimes we're so focused on needing our own problems to be solved that we forget that God has actually caused us to solve a problem. Jesus realized that my radical love for the world causes me to be a radical giver, causes me to be radically generous, so I give my life for them. But I don't give my life for them in vain because I am the answer. I give my life and a problem is solved. The problem of sin, solved. The problem of being eternally separated from God, solved. The problem of knowing where to go when you have nobody else to turn to, solved. The problem of not having a a bridge over troubled water solve the problem of not having a rock to cling to when everything in your life is chaotic solve the problem of not being able to call a priest and you need a direct connection to heaven and the veil is in your way solve everything that we needed it was solved by God going to the cross because he was the answer and God is letting somebody know today the reason why I need you to be radically loving and radically generous is because you are an answer Answer. you are not the answer we know that we're not God we can never be God but he has put us as his hands and feet on this earth to be somebody's answer you are somebody's answer somebody has a question you have the answer somebody has a problem you have the solution somebody's feeling a little heavy you can help carry that burden somebody is lost you can help them find their way and so God is saying to you today you're just generosity is not about how much money you give or don't give this message is not about beating you up or brow beating you into giving this message is about you understanding your significance in the kingdom and knowing that you are an answer yeah. Yeah. your neighbor is an answer yes the person sitting in front of you and behind you, their answer is yes. But stop letting the enemy fool you into thinking that you are not an answer. If you've got breath in your lungs right now, and I hope everyone sitting in here does. If you've got breath in your lungs right now, you're an answer. If you're alive today, it's because you have purpose and you're an answer. If you've got any level of strength to move about, it's because you are an answer and you're still alive because there's somebody whose question still hasn't been answered. There's somebody whose problem still hasn't been answered. And all it takes is your generosity. Some of you are waiting to give out of abundance. God said to tell you, don't give out of abundance, give out of what's available. You're waiting for more time in your schedule before you give. God says, don't give, don't wait for more time. Don't wait for an abundance of time. Give out of what's available. You're waiting to give financially until you have more. God says, not out of abundance, out of availability. 
You're waiting until you get to a certain place in life to give wisdom and advice. God says not out of abundance, out of availability. Because the widow uh, with the two mites, uh, Jesus was outside of the, of the temple. He's seeing what people are going to put in the treasury. And there's so many scribes and Pharisees who are giving. And uh, God says when he sees the widow that she's given more than anybody else who's given to the treasury. Why is that? Because she had given everything she had. She gave her life savings. Whereas those before her who had put into the treasury probably, and we know they could have definitely given more. But they held some back because they were like, I I I'm not going to give too much. I want you to see me give something, but I'm not going to give too much. And God says that what she gave was greater than what they gave, not because her two coins amounted to what they gave, but because she gave out of what was available, not out of her abundance. Your radical generosity will see to it that you have what you need. When you give to God, you will always have what you need. But you don't wait to give out of having a lot. You don't wait to give out of when you feel like giving or feel comfortable. You give out of what's available. And I know sometimes we don't feel like we have much available. But little is much in the hands of the master. Do you know if you do something for somebody else? Once a month, I don't care if it's for your neighborhood or for your church. Do you know that once a month goes a long way if you're giving out of everything you have? Yeah. God's not saying, well, the people that serve twice a month are, are more blessed than the people that serve once a month. He's like, both are blessed if they're giving everything that they can possibly give. I want you to come out of this series not blocked, but I want you to come out blessed. And you can only be blessed through your generosity. I brought them up last week, but Ananias and Sapphira literally lost their lives because they held something back from God. I don't want you to be in danger of losing your life, and I don't mean that you'll die a physical death. We, we, don't, we don't say that here at Link Church. Serve or you'll die. We don't, say, we don't say that. That's not our mantra. But what I mean by losing your life is I don't want you to lose what God has for you while you're still on this earth all because you're lacking in generosity i don't want you to be blessed see you think life is good now if you could be radically generous you would be shocked at what god has in store for you because he says that he will do exceeding and abundantly above all we can ask or even what we're able to think so whatever you can fathom in your mind whatever you can dream about how you want to live god says i'll go above and beyond that i'll go beyond whatever you can think but all you need to unlock that blessing is your generosity Think about what you love. What group of people do you love? What area do you love? And I'm not just relegating it to Link Church, you know. I'm saying in general, what do you love? Who are you called to? Who do you love so much that you wake up thinking about them? Or you wake up thinking about that and you go to bed thinking about that thing or thinking about that group of people or that person. Who are you so passionate about that you're, now your radical love is getting ready to cause you to be radically generous. And once you're radically generous, God is saying, then I will show you just how much you are an answer. Somebody say, I am an answer. I'm done. You can stand. You don't sound like you believe it. Say, I am an answer. You are an answer. And maybe up until this point, you've been struggling to believe your significance. Or maybe you've been struggling to believe your worth. Or maybe you've been struggling to, to feel like whatever you have to offer, it's, it's not enough. And so you'd rather just offer nothing. But God wants you to know that there is not one gift that is better than the other in his kingdom or in this world there's not one person that's better than the other there's not one uh, a calling that's better than the other there's not one level of anointing that's greater than the other the only difference between you being blessed or blocked is your willingness to be the answer 
Because now that I've told you you're an answer, now it's for you to decide what will you do with that information. Will you let that cup pass from you? Or will you drink from it even though it's not convenient? Even though what's inside of it may be challenging and may be bitter, but you know it's necessary and you know that nobody else can get the job done except for you? You're an answer, but what will you do with that? Our prayer team is coming forward because maybe somebody needs somebody to stand with them today to have the strength and the courage to be the answer. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. Look at your own reflection because that's who God is looking for. He's looking for you. I'm going to invite everyone right now to close your eyes. Because the first thing we always want to do is offer somebody the opportunity to come to Christ. Because he is everybody's answer. And so if you've not yet accepted Christ or if for some reason you feel as if you've strayed away from him. He wants you to know that he is the answer no matter where you are, no matter who you are. And so if you need to give your life or rededicate your life to Christ, we want you to just raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you, so that we can see you. And now with your eyes still closed, this next portion of our altar call is for somebody who's been struggling with their purpose, struggling with their significance. And God has spoken to you today and he has confirmed that you are indeed an answer, but you just need somebody to touch and agree with you. If that's you, I want you to come out of your seat. Don't worry about how challenging your calling is. Don't worry about if you're not even sure what your calling is. The fact that you're in here means you are called. You're not here by accident. And God has a problem that he needs you to solve. Can he count on you? I'm going to pray for all of us, but you can still come at any point in time. Father, we thank you today just for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and for your love. We thank you, God, that even though you are the ultimate answer, you still chose us and you still called us and you still gave us an opportunity to also be an answer. Thank you, God, that you have shown us that we unlock our blessings by being generous and we will not give God going forward out of our abundance because the truth is we'll probably never have enough resources, we'll never have enough time, we'll never have enough enough in our storehouses but what we will do is we will give out of our availability and we will trust you to multiply it and we will trust that it will do and serve its purpose according to your will forgive us God for the times when we have denied someone their answer because we weren't willing to be generous I pray today God that you would just help us to open our hands and open our hearts and open our minds to what it is you're saying, how it is you're moving, and what it is you want to do in our lives. We thank you, God, because we trust and believe and declare that as we leave here today, we are not blocked but by the from the things of God, but we are blessed by the Spirit of God. We thank you for grace, we thank you for mercy, and we thank you for favor, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and put your hands together. For watching our service today. We hope and pray that you are encouraged. We love to give here at Link. There are two convenient ways to give to our church. You can text the number 84321 or give online at linkchurchnc.org forward slash give. Join us next week for Link Online. We pray that you have a great and blessed week.